Uh, actually, I'm retired from service for the last you know, last two years. I'm not very active, but what uh, is Dr. Rajiv has said, uh, the knowledge which I've gained in the last few uh, years, I would like to share uh, on the Northeast Indian faces. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Sir. Yeah, everybody knows taxonomy is a science of finding, describing, and giving a name. You know, when you find something that you have to describe, what is its color, what is eye, eye color, what is the hair color, how tall he is, uh, what is his behavior, then we try to give a name to him, whether he's Rajiv Gandhi or Vishnath or Dr. Madhusudan Kuru. So this is taxonomy. And then we study the relationships between species, genus. So in fact, taxonomy is the starting point of any type of biological study. And a species should have only one name. And when I say a name, scientific name, it should apply to the, that single species. There should not be any ambiguity. Uh, so uh, we should say that taxonomy is the starting point of any type of biological study. And we have seen that uh, there has been uh, several misidentifications and several confusions. You know, in India, particularly, I have seen that uh, the students will collect the fish and they bring to the lab and they open the second volume of uh, Francis D's uh, Fishes of India and try to identify with that. And this is not a uh, right thing, a very serious effort and systematic approach is required in taxonomy. So this is the thing. And the misidentification, misidentified fish for that molecular studies have been done, it is submitted to this bank and it has already created a lot of confusion. So uh, we should be very careful that the fishes, the species is correctly identified. But we also know that the science of taxonomy has been neglected for quite some time because uh, the younger generation now, they prefer to work in air conditioned labs with a pronoun and uh, with uh, sophisticated instruments. And taxonomy, in fact, it, it, is in, it involves a lot of field work, then bring to the lab, then uh, do a lot of things. And so for quite some time, taxonomy has been confined only to a handful of scientists in dusty museums and harbor area. But now people have recognized that without taxonomy, we, can, we cannot proceed. That's why new, new generations have come. You see, who is this man? He is Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation. Everyone knows. Who is he? Is he Mahatma Gandhi? No, he's Ben Kingsley, who acted as Gandhi in Richard Attenborough's film in 1982. So uh, we can very easily misidentify Ben Kingsley as Mahatma Gandhi. Here lies the taxonomy. Next, please. Now coming to uh, Northeast India. Northeast India is a very unique type of geographical uh, 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 location. And it consists of Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, uh, Nagaland, Manipur, Meghalaya, uh, Mizoram, Tripura, and the, the Sikkim. So when we look here, it is a political unit. But in fact, it is connected to the rest of the country by a very narrow Siliguri corridor, also known as the chicken's neck, and its width is only about 20 kilometers. And it, is, it has got a very unique geography. And this is a very important part of the Eastern Himalaya, fresh water by the Abrasti Hotspot. And you know, by the Abrasti Hotspot means it contains a lot of endemics which are under threat. That's why Northeast India is a very important area where we can uh, do a lot of work on uh, fresh water biodiversity. Next, please. Next, please. Now you see here, this is the map of Northeast India. And we see so many rivers and tributaries crisscrossing the entire region. And uh, uh, next, click this. But here we should uh, always remember if when we work on fish taxonomy that for a freshwater fish, drainage basin is the boundary. And the, a fish will not recognize whether the fish is going to Myanmar or Bhutan, China or Bangladesh. For them, the water body is the boundary. 
except for a few fish like uh, everything fishes or very prolific breeders which are transported from one place to another along with uh, uh, along with uh, fish seeds. Otherwise, the fish are confined to a particular uh, uh, drainage basin in Bombay. So this is what we see in North India. Next click. Now see, these uh, crisscrossing uh, drainages, when we closely look into it, we find that it consists of the Brahmaputra drainage, we have the Tista drainage, we have the Barak, Surma, and Meghna drainage, we have the Karnafuli, the Kaladan, and the Chindwin. So Chindwin in no way is connected with the Brahmaputra or with the Barak, Surma, and Meghna. Kaladan River basin, drainage basin, is very unique. It is neither connected with Chindwin or Karnafuli. So we expect that uh, expect that the freshwater fish pond of, of these regions, even though it is a single political unit, we will find so many endemics in this region, and which are uh, which are different from each other. Faunal component is different from each other. Next, please. You see, here we have to understand a few things. Uh, years back, million years back, about 400, 500 million years back. The whole art was in a supercontinent called the Pansia. And uh, you know, the inner core of the art is very hot. And above that, there is a mantle which is fluid in nature. And this fluidy mantle will be moving. It's a, it is it will be having the convection current due to the heat from the core. And due to this convection current, the topmost layer, which is hard lithosphere will be drifting, just like when you boil the milk in a low flame, the upper part of the milk, semi-solid milk part will be moving slightly. Like that, it, was, it is always in the state of motion. That is called as the tectonic uh, motion. And that Panjia broke into the northern supercontinent and southern super, supercontinent. The southern supercontinent is known as the Gondwana. It has broken into South America, South Africa, the India, Australia, and Antarctica. And South America will be moving towards North America. Uh, Africa will be moving towards the Europe. And India will be moving towards the Chinese uh, uh, Asia, like that. But the problem is that when South America and Africa was moving in a very slow speed, Indian subcontinent, the Gondwanan part of India, was moving very fast. Why? Because the lithospheric roots of India has already fallen off. And India is hardly 100 kilometers thick, whereas South America and Africa are about 300 kilometers thick. And this is the reason why the coalition of India with Chinese plate is very, very vigorous. And it has resulted in the formation of west to east extending Himalayas. So for a fish taxonomist, it's not simply counting the fins and the morphometry and this and that, but also we should see that how our continent and how the, the drainage have been evolved and what could be the relationship of this fish to that group of fish that we should have, uh, particularly when we work with the fish. Next, please. So, next slide. So, about, about 40 million years back, the Indian supercontinent was uh, colliding with Himalaya on the north. I'm sorry, China on the north. I can't see the, that side. Uh, the, on the eastern side, it was colliding with the Burmese plate. And the west to east extending Himalaya is now deflected towards south, southwest. And that, that point is known as a Tuding Tiding fissure, uh, which lies somewhere on the northern part of Arunachal Pradesh and the southern part of uh, Yunnan province. So this is very interesting. So the collision of Indian plate with the Eurasia uh, the uh, Eurasian plate has resulted in the formation of the Himalaya on the north and Indo-Burman range, also known as the Indo-Myanmar range in the east. So this has a lot of do, to do with the river basin evolution. Next, please. Next, please. Now, when the Indian plate is sliding beneath the Eurasian plate on the north, it has resulted in the upliftment of the Himalayan mountains. And in the east, the Indo-Myanmar range 
is formed due to the sliding of the Indian plate beneath the Myanmar plate, also known as the Myanmar microplate. And you see here, the Indo-Myanmar range is formed. And here lies Manipur, Nagaland, Mizoram, and the Rakhine Yoma Hills. And on the western part, we have the Surma Basin. And the eastern part of the indo burmese range, we have the uh, volcanic uh, rocks. And on the eastern side, we have the Chimbin Basin. Again, another Myanmar vol volcanic arc. Then we have the Irrawaddy Basin. So this, we need to understand how uh, things have happened in the past and uh, how the river basins have evolved. Next, please. See, we, when you, we see the Google map, uh, this type of uh, you know, fissure and comparison of the rocks is very clearly seen on the top, on the northern part of uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, and on the east. So you see that so many uh, you know, compressions and depressions are formed. And this is a result of the collision in the east as well as in the north. Next, please. Now, uh, he, uh, he, 2001, and Peng et al. 2006, they have done a lot of work uh, on this, and they found that the collision between Indian plate with the Chinese plate, it was uh, it was having a changes in the uh, in geomorphology in various waves. In the first wave, we have the Ganga, Shangpo, and the whole of Tibet. They were uh, interconnected by drainages, and by that time. Uh, the fissures like glyptosternon, which is a slightly primitive out of the glyptosternins, were very uh, were found were very widely distributed. Now, a second wave of upliftment of the Tibetan plateau has taken place. Then the third upliftment. So this has resulted in the delink of the river basins. The the the, the ecological conditions have changed, and this. A place where the upliftment, the third upliftment occurs is somewhere between Arunachal Pradesh, the southern China, and Yunnan. And here we find very highly specialized groups of uh, uh, Vicarian species of Lithosternoids like Crete Eucolopulanis, Paracailopulanis, Oriopulanis, etc. So when you compare the morphology of Lithosternoids and the highly evolved Lithosternoids, we find that there's a lot of uh, uh, changes in the morphology, like the pectoral and pipe pins are widely expanded. The lips morphology, the barbels are highly specialized for torrential type of uh, uh, habitats. So this is how uh, it was uh, worked. Now, next please. Uh, Ruber et al, they have done a very good work on the phylogeny of uh, Badits the body day. And after molecular study of bodies, they could come, they could hypothesize, and they have modified this drainage basin evolution. After yes, Anything? Now, I'm audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Is it audible? Now, in the past, you know, what they have predicted as a hypothesis, the Sangpo, the west to east flowing Sangpo Tibet was flowing towards the east and it was connected to the Red River and it was uh, connected with the South China Sea. And to that, the, the upper part of Salwin, the upper part of Mekong and upper part of Yangtze, they were all connected. The middle part of Yangtze was flowing towards the west and it was connected to the Red River whereas the lower part of Yangtze was flowing east and uh, it was connected to the China Sea. Brahmaputra, Irabadi, Salvin, and Mekong, the, they, are, they were having uh, different, you know, uh, you know, southward flow and they're not connected at all. Next, click, please. Click, please. Now, now the westward flowing Yangtze now has delinked from the rest of Yangtze and now it is flowing towards the east in the next wave. Click please. Now, the Yangtze, the upper, middle, and the uh, lower Yangtze, they have interconnected. The Red River is left alone. The Mekong, then the Salwin and Irabadi, 
the Iravadi was having capture with the Shangpo. You see, the Shangpo and Iravadi was having the, the that is thing. That, and the last place, last one. Now, the Shangpo has captured with Brahma. The latest one, which is available now, is that Shangpo is now captured, capturing with Brahmaputra. Iravadi is separated, Salvani is separated. Now, please imagine now, in the past few uh, years, how the sharing of the fish fauna of Sampo to Red River, to Mekong, to Salvin, to Iravati, and now with the Brahmaputra. What would have happened in the formation of new species, new genera uh, that we could you know, imagine? And this is what we need to study in fish taxonomy, that how this can be related to that fish. So this we can uh, easily see, and Dr. Uh, Rubar et al. have done a very good work, and he et al. have also done very good work, and they, they have, we have many works to do regarding this, uh, you know, interrelationships of uh, fish fauna. Next, please. Now, similarly, we can see, you see on the left side, we have the Nagaland on the north, Manipur in the middle, and Mizoram in the last. So, the indo burman race is extending from north to uh, southwest, and it will go to Rakhine state. It will go inside water uh, in the Bay of Bengal, and it will emerge as Bay of Bengal. I'm sorry, the Andaman Islands. So this indo burmese range, somewhere uh, it is deflecting towards the south, and it has to do a lot. And if you really look into this, the continental margins of the uh, Indian plate and the Burmese plate are somewhere in the middle of Manipur and Nagaland and Mizoram. So here lies the interest of his study in Manipur. If you really look in Dr. Soibam, Professor Soibam uh, and his colleagues have done a very good work in Manipur University in the Art Sciences Department. And this is the map they have shown. The Manipur, although it is a single political unit, if you go towards the, uh, towards the right, on the north right, you see the metamorphic rocks. The green colored one is Ophiolites. Then the brown colored, dark brown colored rocks are the sound shells. Then on the Western uh, pink color is the barail. Then the yellow color is the tipam. And in the West, we have the uh, uh, surma. So uh, different rocks are there. And you see, uh, when the two plates collided, the compression was somewhere, somewhere in the Patkoi Hills then to the Nagaland. Then when they collided, there is rifting again. So this, this rifting has uh, resulted in the subduction and it has resulted in the formation of the Impal Central Valley where you find the alluvium and you find the alluvium in the west in the Jiribam and the Basar Plains also. So the, this has to do a lot in the formation of the different rivers. And when you see the rivers on the right side, the drainage of basins, you know, the western part is totally drained by the Barak drainage, and the middle part is Manipur drainage. Then the eastern part is the U River drainage. The northern part is the mm, uh, Tiju River drainage. Although Manipur drainage, U drainage, and uh, uh, this uh, Tiju drainage are all a part of this union, but Manipur drainage is a different subbasin, U drainage is a different subbasin. And the northward flowing tissue drainage is a different submission. And accordingly, we find different uh, uh, composition of faunas. So this is very important. Next, please. Yeah, uh, it's not a final list, but uh, the whole Northeast India and the adjoining areas, uh, we have uh, seen that there are about 500 species of fishes under 144 genera, maybe more, and about uh, 35 families. A lot of diversity is found in this region. And uh, maximum diversity we found in the family Cyprinidae where we get uh, 39 genera and about 100 species, 160 species. And next one is the family Saishoridae where there are about 19 to 20 genera and some species. So I cannot discuss all these things uh, in this very short time, but some important genera and families uh, uh, I just want to highlight. In this lecture. Next, please. See, under Cyprinidae, there, there is a very interesting uh, group of fish, the Neonella. Uh, it was described by Tyson Roberts in 1996. It's also known as a microglass fish. 
And this is a very tiny vertebrate organism of a maximum length of about two centimeters. And it is a uh, transparent except for some uh, black spots. And uh, still there is a small, the smaller species is the Pedocypris. Uh, it is found in South Asia, but still it is a very small fish. And uh, mm, Dr. Bridge has also described uh, some from Burma. And he has also described from uh, Darjeeling Hills, that is a Danionella, uh, Mirifica, and uh, these are the fishes. And this is very unique and it is not found anywhere uh, in, the, in the country. Next, please. Now, this is Ipsy Beres. Very interestingly, this was a fish which I described for the first time in my lifetime in 1986. I named it as uh, Puntius Jairami after Dr. Jairam. But unfortunately, uh, this uh, fish has turned out to be uh, Hipsy Barbers Mitkine, described by Mukherjee sometime in 1940 from Myanmar. And, uh, you know, the local men, local people in Manipur, they call it as a hiccup. Now, hiccup means it is a water chestnut and the fruit of uh, water chestnut has water spines. And the dorsal, sp dorsal spine is very sharp and it will, you know, harm you, this thing, that the fishiness and all. So this is a hipsy barbers, barbers you find only in Burma and some parts of Manipur is a very good for fish and the dorsal uh, sp spine is serrated. And this is one. Next, please. Now, this is Poropontius again, confined to this region. Uh, some uh, workers, they confuse this fish, Poropontius, with uh, uh, Systomus. But uh, when you look closer, uh, you will see that uh, Poropontius is not, not the Systomus, because Systomus serana, I have seen here, I have shown here the systemus has a dorsal spine which is finely serrated, whereas the poropotheus has got a dorsal spine which is uh, denticulated, the large denticles, and uh, the snout is having pores, uh, hence the name poropotheus. So uh, poropotheus is uh, found in Manipur uh, and uh, in the Barak drainage up to Brahmaputra and it is found in China, Yunnan also. So this is very unique in this region, poropotheus. Next, please. Another uh, genus, Semiplotus, very interesting. This is uh, uh, having the snout overhanging the mouth. And it is very unique in having a mouth called a sector mouth. Uh, the sector mouth is inferior. Uh, it has got the exposed ponified cutting mandibular edge. And dorsal fin is about is 19 half to 22 half. Now, very interesting thing is that the sector mouth, the lower uh, uh, lower jaw is a cutting, and uh, my students have found that in the Burma India border, the fishes will swim from Sidwin to Manipur in shoals of 300 at midnight when there is full moon. And uh, they, they could see that the fish is browsing, the 300 fish, 200 fish are browsing the bottom algae on the pebbles. And when the fish have passed, the place, they will see that the bottom is totally white. So this is how they feed on the uh, algae, which is interested on the rocks. So this is the characteristic of semiplotus. Next, please. The genus semiplotus uh, have been confused for quite long with the genus Cyprinian. And uh, this uh, doubt has been clarified by Banarasku in her sick 1995. And fortunately, I had an opportunity to meet Dr. Banarasku long back in 1996, and he handed over his revision. And it is very clear that you see, in Cyprinian, the dorsal fin is not more than 10 to 11, the branch rays, whereas in Semiplotus, it is more than, uh, to, more than 12 alloys. And please see the pores in the snow. So now it is a very, and the Cyprinian is a genus which is confined only in the Middle East. And this is Cyprinian Muscatensi, uh, one of my friends sent me uh, from Arabia, Saudi Arabia. So now semiplotus break. Even in the catalog of fishes, you know, our semiplotus, semiplotus is still written as opinion semiplotus. That's wrong. And I wanted to make this clarification. Next, please. And very interestingly, my students have found by studying osteology that semiplotus is a quite a very primitive Cyprinian 
me there, separate phase, uh, which I cannot you know, explain now. And uh, we have only three species of semiplotus in the world. Semiplotus cirrhosus, confined to Chindwin. Semiplotus semiplotus, confined only to Brahmaputra. And semiplotus modestus, described by day from uh, 1870 from Situi, uh, Burma. It is found only in Kaladan. It's very interesting. It's not found anywhere in the world. And this is called kingfish. Why it is called kingfish? In Assam, a fisherman will catch the fish, but if he doesn't offer this one fish to the king, he'll be punished. So, so is the test of this fish. And uh, likewise, in Burma also, this is known as the Burmese kingfish. The difference between the three is that in the shape of the pores and uh, particularly the semiplotus modestus is differentiated from the from the two species by having a uh, finely serrated dorsal uh, spine, whereas cirrhosis and semiplotus have got a very uh, smooth spines. So this is a matter of an uh, interesting subject and when, when we can work further on molecular you know, characterization and uh, see which one is uh, Apomorphic, which one is uh, you know, uh, that is for the left for the future work we should study. Next, please. So, this is what I'm saying that uh, cirrhosis in the Chinwen and uh, modestus in the Kaladan. And uh, uh, next, please. Now, coming to Nima Kailite is a very interesting uh, group of families. And there is one genus known as New Eusurictis. It was described first by Banarasco in Nalpan 1968, and it is monotypic. And we have only one species called as New Eusurictis, my Delhi. They described it from Nepal, but fortunately, I could collect this fish from Northern Bengal near Siliguri. And uh, the unique thing of this uh, genus is that the mouth is totally horseshoe shaped uh, compared to other Nimakailins. So this is a monotypic and endemic in this region. Next, please. Yeah, another very interesting group of fish, Eborictis, described by Chong Tri, 1913. And you see that the whole Arunachal Pradesh, the upper part of Burma and some part of Yunnan and uh, a little part of Meghalaya also. Although all those drainages uh, connected to Brahmaputra, they have this beautiful unique genus, Eborictis, highly long head. The vent is far ahead of the anal fin and nostrils are having barbell like outgrowths. So this is the characteristics. Now, what I want to say is that the top two species are uh, Eborictis kempe, uh, which was uh, uh, some, some years back, it was synonymized with uh, Eborictis botanensis. But in fact, it's a valid uh, species. And uh, our observation, my observation, and uh, my students who are working in our natural place, they observed that, you know, there is ontogenic change in the coloration. And the caudal fin, when you see the younger ones are having, you know, a haphazard type of uh, uh, coloration. However, in the adult, you know, the, the dark coloration, the dark brown coloration is on the uh, posterior margin. So uh, there is every possibility that the piece is misidentified and people try to describe as a new, but in fact, uh, for this type of fish, you need to really see the different uh, size groups so that there's no confusion. So this is endemic only part in this particular beautiful ornamental fish. Next please. Now Mustura is a genus newly uh, this, uh, described by Maurice Spotlight 2019. In fact, these fishes uh, we have been uh, identifying as a Paisocistura. And uh, Paisocistura is characteristic in having uh, the lower lip. It is uh, having two lobes and uh, discontinuous. But he has found one more character in this, that in males, the first and the second branch rays of the pectoral fin are united and with no membrane in between. And a closer look shows that these two membranes, uh, first and second branch rays, are having a lot of tubercles on the base. So on this basis, he has, uh, and also uh, studying the uh, air bladder, which is unique, 
not, not different from others. Uh, based on these two, three characters, he has uh, identified as a, a New Zealand Mustura, and we have a lot of Musturas here in Northeast and in Burma. Next, please. This is another genus, very important, Neonima kailas. And uh, uh, we have a few species, Neonima kailas assamensis, Neonima kailas peguensis, only three, four species we have. And this is very characteristic in having hypertrophic lips. You please see the lower lip, which is highly, you know, uh, inflated. And this is the characteristic of Neonima kailas. Next, please. Raiko Sistura, again, it was recognized as Sistura, but uh, Maurice Kotlet, uh, he has published, and he found that here also in the males, the pectoral fin is slanted upwards. The first, second, third, and fourth branch rays of the pectoral fin are fused and not even a, a, a membrane in between. So, and again, uh, I, have seen is, uh, I have seen that many, uh, like uh, uh, formerly we identified as Sistura manipurensis, uh, was described by Chowdhury in 1912. Uh, so many, but the caudal fin you see here, it is slightly emarginated and it is having this type of haphazard uh, uh, colorations. So all our ecosisturas, I have examined that uh, they are having this type of caudal fins. So this is a genus confined in this part of the world. Next, please. Emblicipidite, again, a very uh, interesting genus, a small face, uh, uh, torrential catfish, torrent catfish, we could use to call it. It is very unique in having, you know, the dorsal fin very uh, ahead, uh, dorsally, and you find that at the base of the fins, there are a lot of muscle pads, the fatty muscle pads, and bodies are very fatty, and sometimes we uh, see that there's no, uh, 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 you know, letter line. But when you scrap with a scalpel, you see the letter line. So uh, initially I described as a letter line absent, but I, I scrapped it and found the letter lines here. This is a thing. The emblicipitite, emblicips, uh, several genus have been described by uh, Hioki and my colleagues also, and I have also described two, three species. And uh, very unique uh, in this uh, genus is that you see here, the caudal fin, the procurant and the principal rays, when you closely examine, they have got the pinnate rays, also known as the pinnate-like rays. And uh, uh, also in some of the species, you'll find that you see the hyporeals and the parahyporeals on the caudal fin and the rays coming out of that, the cartilaginous rays of the upper lobe and lower lobe of the fins, they are having strongly developed cartilaginous projections. And this is also very unique in this type of uh, emblicips. May not be present in all, but in many of the species we have studied, uh, there are pinnate rays or the strongly developed uh, projections in the caudal fins. Next, please. Now, this is a kaiside, again, a very unique type of genus, a small fish, but when you look at it, it's having a very cryptic coloration, a very confusing type of uh, coloration, but, but it is very unique in having the tubercles arranged in parallel rows. I have seen there on the upper part of the slide with the yellow arrow. And there's another genus known as Parakaisis, which is confined only to the Borneo, that is in the Indo-Australian archipelago. But the Akaisis are found only in this part of the world in Sindhuan Basin. We have Akaisis manipurensis. We have described the Akaisis prasadi. This is also a very unique type of genus. Next, please. Sisori de, uh, I'm sorry, Sisoro de, the spelling is wrong. I will not go into detail because uh, Dr. Rameshwari will be giving a lecture on Sisoric uh, catfaces in the afternoon. Here, I want to show only a few genera. Uh, Sudolagopia mistra, 1976. Sudolagopia, you know, in under Sisori de, we have uh, Sisori ni and we have Glitostani ni, Glitostani ni, Sisori ni. And under Sisori de, Sisori ne, we have uh, genera having thoracic adhesive apparatus. Whereas in uh, in the group Glyptostani uh, we don't have the thoracic adhesive uh, thoracic adhesive apparatus. The Sudolagopia is a group under Sisori ne, 
under sexuality, and it is very characteristic in having the thoracic adhesive apparatus, which is uh, longer than wide, and it may extend up to the abdomen. And the cubital humeral process is, is very conspicuous. So several pseudolabia have been described from this region, from Myanmar, from Mizoram, from Burma by my colleagues, as well as Dr. Hugh Pei in the past few years. Next slide, please. You see here, pseudolobia. I'm showing the uh, left one cubito humeral process, which is with the arrow, the black arrow. In fact, this is in Rita Rita, not in the pseudolobia. I just wanted to show that this is the process and you find in the pseudolobia in the upper slide also. And you see on the right side, the thoracic adhesive apparatus. I would like to say that it extends up to the abdomen, unlike in glyptothorax and in the pseudocinus. So this is the uniqueness of this genus and very small face, but widely distributed, several genera, several species in the region. Next, please. Uh, this is the key to glyptostanine and glyptostanine, and uh, this you can see later. There are two things I want to show. Uh, I want to tell that post labial grew, present, absent, interrupted. So this is very important. And in the uh, second thing is you have to see the tooth pads in the upper jaw and lower jaw, either they are joined or separate. And the teeth in the jaws are homodon or heterodon. So these are the things you need to see when you are identifying glyptosternine, glyptosternine the glyptosternins. Next, please. You see here, this is how you see the post label group is absent. The mouth below, there is no post label group. Under this, we have a genus known as Paracyloglanis. And Paracyloglanis adgarti is the type of species. You find in Nepal, you find in the upper part of uh, Arunachal Pradesh in this Tartanese. So in this, the post label group is absent. Next, please. Now, here, the post label group is present. You see here the mouth of uh, Oreoglanis. Mosasculus, I have described long back. And you see that the between the lower labial flap and the, the thorax chin, there is a groove. And that groove may be continuous or it is interrupted in the bill uh, that you have to give. So under this, we have the glyptosternum, as I said, it is found in Nepal and some part of Bhutan. And uh, comparatively, the pectoral fins are shorter and it's not reaching to the uh, ventral fin. Uh, see, I, I say that this is a slightly primitive compared to other cryptosternins. But if you look into Prete Eukyloglanis, uh, Binet, uh, the last one, you see the, the pectoral and pelvic fins are very widely expanded. And you see the lips, pectoral and pelvic fins, they're united to form a, some sort of a disc-like adhesive apparatus, which will be attaching those rocks. Next, please. Yeah, this is exostoma. As I tell you, uh, you please go to the next slide. Next slide. This is a mayor's glanis. Previous slide. Previous slide. Yeah. If you compare exostoma and mayor's glanis, it seems that they are very alike, uh, maybe of the same genus. But as I said earlier, when you look at the tooth patches in exostoma, the upper jaw tooth patches are separate. This is the ACM uh, I have taken in my physics department of exostoma labiatum. So this is how you have, you have to, you will separate exostoma from Mayer's clonus. Next, please. So this is Mayer's clonus and Mayer's clonus, uh, it was described by Hora and Silas and it was thought to be the monotypic from uh, Nepal, from Tista, uh, Mayer's clonus, Blitzy. But uh, fortunately, I, along with Dr. Kosizin, we could find another species from Sindhuin, and that we have named as Mayer's clonus Jairami. Here we see that the upper, upper jaw, the two tooth patches are united. And uh, a closer look of the teeth, uh, it shows that the teeth is or shaped. In some other literature, you will find that uh, Mayer's clonus will have a uh, pointed teeth and uh, exostoma will have or shaped. No, we find that uh, it, it seems that the tit, just like the human beings, it has got a milk tit, adult tit. The tit will shed and it will develop. And in this process, there may be, you know, heterodont, homodont, or 
the pointed teeth and also teeth may be there. So this is my observation. And uh, I did share, he's not going to determine whether it is a stoma or meniscal clonus. But more important is that the upper jaw is united and separated. Next, please. So this is oriogalanus again, the Moses clause I have described from our nasopretus. And you see here, the maxillary verbals, the paired fins cushion, they're highly plicated. And even the maxillary verbals have got the, you know, papillae, you see shown by this thing, by the arrow. Or oh, these are highly modified. And as I shown you in the second or third slide, the third upliftment of the Tibetan plateau, it has resulted in the formation of this type of highly specialized hill stream group of fishes. Next, please. Cellulite, another uh, genus is Tyrocryptus, which is also not found um, widely in other parts of the country. And this is just like uh, Claudius, but the shorter uh, barbels. And it is giving a very small dorsal fin, which is very ahead. And we have only two or three species of Therocryptus, Therocryptus, uh, Gengelicus, uh, Indica, Baracensis, which we described. Next, please. Chakide, another very interesting fish. In Assam, uh, it has been uh, you know, named as the, the ugliest fish, and it has no food value. But the population of this Chakki, Chaka, Chaka Chaka, is declining and uh, it has been exported to European countries as ornamental fish. The ugliest fish in Assam has become ornamental fish in Europe. So this is it. And you have a Chakka Barmenica in the Chindian Basin also. Next, please. Yeah, under Bagradia, there is one genus known as Rama. And it is also a very small one, semi-transparent. And it is also confined only in the Tishtatranese and some part of the Western uh, Assam in the Prabhupada this is also unique. This is also endemic in this region. Next, please. Yeah, so Duri Day, uh, is also known as artworm eels. This is Pilaya, and the Chauduria is another genus. And my friend, uh, Dr. Raf, has also described new ones from Burma as well as from India. And this is a small fish. Uh, I think it's confined only to Eastern Himalaya. Next, please. Uh, Badi Day, uh, Dr. Kulander and Dr. Uh, you know, Rob Bridge, they have done a beautiful review of bodies of the world. And this is an excellent uh, ornamental fish group. And you find, uh, they said that uh, from the Chittagong towards the west, there's no body day. But I don't know, I'm not sure. But it is uh, widely distributed in Assam, uh, in some parts of Assam, uh, Burma. And this is very characteristic in having the dorsal spines, the soft and the uh, spinous dorsal, they are contiguous and uh, mm, the, the lateral lines are on the tip of the tubes. Uh, so, so this is a badis. Uh, I have also described one or two badis from this region. This is one genus we can work with. And on, based on this body molecular studies, they have predicted, they have hypothesized the drainage basin evolution in South and Southeast Asia. Next, please. Sunny day. Probably the last genus I'm going to discuss here. Channa, also known as snake heads. Uh, everybody knows Channa snake head. It is very unique in having the suprabranchial chamber with bony lamellae as accessory respiratory organ. So they are soul alive. They're known as the live fishes because they can breathe air, uh, atmospheric air. Now, there are some more groups, but in the Northeast, India, there are two groups. One is the Kachua group, and the second group is the Marvillus group. The Marvillus group is characteristic in having the V shaped isthmus. Gachua group is having characteristic in having U shaped isthmus, and it has got a two large cycloid scales, two or four large cycloid scales on the lower jaw. So, this is the next place. Next place. Now, uh, Lucas Ruba et al. 2019, they have done a good work on Gatswago uh, or molecular studies. And uh, they have found that 40% of the Chanids are Gatswago group. And uh, they are confined. The Indo-Myanmar range 
West of the Mermaids, this is the outstanding hotspot of Chinese diversity. So we find more than 20 species of uh, Chanas in this region belonging to Pachuan group. So this is a further, uh, we, need to, we need to do a lot of further works on this Chanits. Next, please. So well, ultimately, I want to say that freshwater fish taxonomy, when we say it involves more political studies, as I shown here, the total length, depth of body, so many things. Then we need to see the stages in the life history of the ontogenic changes. You see here the coloration of the same species from juvenile to adult. It will be uh, you know, misleading. Then we need to see the sexual dimorphism, in particular in lepidosimilitis. The females are having a simple pectoral, but the uh, uh, males are having you know the seven and the eight uh, branches are fused, and they have got a adipose cushion. And this is expressed only in the breeding season. You don't find it other. So in the rest of the season, you will find that males and females are similar. Then, of course, people are we are working on molecular characteristics, barcoding, and systematics. Then we need to see the habitat then drainage basin evolution, and if possible, the paleo geotectonic setting, which has resulted in the drainage formation and uh, which will be linked with the study of our evolutionary studies. Next, please. So we have a lot of uh, tasks ahead. You know, you know, Hamilton, McClellan, they have described so many new species in two lines, three lines, and they have not designated any types. So as per the quote now, we need to designate types. You know, uh, still now, court has not uh, given the permission to describe new species based on molecular characteristics. Maybe, you know, I meant that. But as of now, we need to describe, designate types as by the court. And there are several taxonomy ambiguities that needs to be, you know, studied, revisited. We need to re-describe so many species in general, which are of vague character. Then Phil works correct identification. And we, we see that a lot of fishes are you know, you know, collected and dumped in museums of several universities and museums, which is not been identified. Then we need to go for multiple characterizations. Then, we, then after that, we have to go for categorization of threat status. Then we plan for conservation strategies. Next slide. Last slide. So with this uh, uh, comment, I want to wind up my lecture that we taxonomists have important roles to play in solving separate problems. Thank you.